Ladies and gentlemen, our next panel is Working Towards Citizens First Solutions, featuring Acting Deputy Secretary Ken Cuccinelli, Rich Valdez, and moderated by Deneen Borelli. Thank you. Good afternoon, Patriots. Yeah. So uh, I want to start off the panel by saying, call me old school, but I thought the primary role of government was to protect its citizens. <laughs> Amen to that. But unfortunately, we have Democrats that are supporting sanctuary cities putting the welfare of illegal aliens before Americans. And that is the launch of our discussion. I want to read a statement to you, and this is from a news release from the U.S. Information and Customs Enforcement. And I quote, Reza Khan, 21, an unlawfully present Guyanese national, was arrested January 10 by the NYPD, the New York Police Department, and charged with murder, sexual abuse, contact by forcible compulsion, and sexual abuse against a person incapable of consent. Khan was previously released from a local law enforcement custody in November 2019 with an active detainer due to New York City's sanctuary policies, end quote. The victim, a 92-year-old woman. There was an active ICE detainer which was ignored by local law enforcement. This is one of many stories, and I want to start with Rich, because you and I were speaking backstage about this very subject. If you could just elaborate. Well, thank you, Denise Borelli, and thank you, CPAC. It's so great to be here in the best country that God's ever created, the United States. What Deneen was talking about, something hit really close to home. We were talking and I was telling her, I got a text from my brother about that story. It was from Fox News. And I told him, I'd already seen this story because I read it in the New York Post. And he says, you're missing the point. And I said, what's the point? And he says, that is Daria's grandmother. And I said, oh, wow. And Daria is his sister-in-law's cousin's grandmother. So there's like two degrees of separation between this family and my own family. And I said, oh, my gosh. This, that's when it became incredibly real that this wasn't just a, a sweet, innocent, poor old woman that was strangled, raped, and murdered in Queens, but it was actually someone that we knew. And it, it really, that, that pulls at the heartstrings, and it lets you, it makes you think, it gives you pause and says, who cares about your politics? We have to put America first and the security and safety of our citizens. Yes. Deputy Secretary Cuccinelli. Yeah, you know, when this case arose, uh, I mean, it's, it's one of the more stark and violent tragedies we've seen. Um, partly because it's one of the more helpless victims. Uh, but at the same time, we have seen this happen to children from people who we had requested, the Department of Homeland Security, ICE, had requested from previous arrests that criminals be turned over to us. And you'll hear, you'll hear two things frequently, I won't say in defense, because there's really no defense of this, but on the other side. One is, that, well, the rate of crime among illegal aliens is no different than any others. I, I won't even argue over that because it doesn't matter. That's fake news. The, the, the reality is, in this woman's case, in the Fuentes case, in many of the children I'm thinking of, and we're sitting here in PG County, they had MS-13 murder of a 14-year-old girl last, last summer with their policies right here in this county. And um, these, are, these are crimes that should never happen. 
It isn't a question of the rate of crime. The rate should be zero because the criminals shouldn't be in this country. Right on. And, and we have given these communities the way to protect themselves by removing these violent criminals from their communities. So zero, that's argument one. Argument two is that the victims have no voice. They have no voice. So when you're PG County right here where we sit or New York City, uh, they're literally defending criminals. And this is not against President Trump. They're defending criminals at the expense of victims. So who are you for? Well, Mayor de Blasio's for criminals. Governor Cuomo's for criminals. And we can go around the country with mayors and, and governors across the country who are literally picking criminals over crime victims in completely preventable crimes. And that, that's, that's the worst of all here is how, how completely avoidable all of this is. These aren't percentages or odds or maybe it'll happen to me. These are literally crimes that could have been completely prevented, 100% guarantee if they had simply cooperated with Immigration Customs Enforcement, with ICE, with the Department of Homeland Security, and with President Trump's effort to keep all of you safe and everyone else in America as well. Sure. Is the media doing its job? Why is there not such outrage over this? You know, uh, it is interesting. I used a local example. I'll use another one. The only local media person in America that I know of that does a good job on this is because he just acts like what we think a journalist is supposed to act like. His name's Kevin Lewis. He's in Montgomery County, right here, the next county over. And, and he, I don't know politically what Kevin Lewis believes. How about that, a journalist who you don't know what their political beliefs are. Right. But he just reports what happens in his community. And so this past June, when their chief executive declared Montgomery County a county of over a million people to be a sanctuary county, and then they proceeded to have a rape or murder, including of children, every week for nine straight weeks. Nine straight weeks of victimization by people who were removable from this country. Kevin Lewis reported on it, and he just said what happened. That's all he did. How about that? Truth. Truth. Facts. Yeah. And the truth is a powerful ally, as we all know here. And facts are what we expect from a responsible media. So to answer your question, by and large, the answer is no. I single out Kevin Lewis because he's a complete exception in the journalist profession of actually reporting news and letting all the rest of us draw our own conclusions. Sure. If that were going on in every community, if that existed in New York, if that existed in Los Angeles, you'd have a different outcome, and let me prove it to you. So let's go back to Montgomery County. By the fall of 2019, and the victimization after victimization, including of children as young as 11 years old, they backed off. Uh, there is accountability from public pressure. Many of you here probably went to the protests in Montgomery County with Michelle Malkin and others, right? And that pressure in an overwhelmingly single party jurisdiction still got them to change their, their policy. And what we care about in the Department of Homeland Security isn't what they say, it's what they do. And they started to cooperate with ICE. They started to let us know when these criminals were going to get released. And lo and behold, we haven't had nine weeks of victimization since that time. Right. It works. Security works. Yeah. And it keeps their community safe, too. So it, it can be turned around, and it can be made to work in the most partisan of communities we've got. Sure. Rich? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to chime in on that. Uh, I as I mentioned, uh, the granddaughter of the deceased woman we spoke about, I, I had a chance to interview her this week, uh, just a couple of days ago, on a podcast that we do. And th that was the point that she made. She said, you know, it's amazing how nobody knows about this stuff. Right. 
it becomes a media story when this woman is, her words, killed three times. Yeah. Her back was broken. Her neck was broken. She was raped, and then she was murdered, strangled to death. And she, it really has to give you pause when you say, wow, is that what it takes for the media to respond to a crisis? The fact that MS-13, you mentioned that earlier, in Queens, New York, shooting each other, rival gangs, broad daylight, 12 noon, on a crowded subway. These things are happening, and it's a flash in the pan. It's 24 hours, 48 hours. So something that she said in our interview, which really stuck with me, was that she's going to dedicate the rest of her days to making sure that sanctuary city policies are defeated. Yeah. Good. Good. And why do you think Democrats are, are so supportive of sanctuary cities? You know, coming up in politics, somebody taught me a long time ago, and they said, it's about the money. And when it's not about the money, it's about the money. Yeah. And it, it, I think there's so much truth in that. I think irrespective of how people will vote, it's more about heads and head count and census and redistricting congressional seats. Right. The more people you have, the more money, the power of the purse. That's what it comes down to. And I think they're putting not only party, but politics over patriotism, and that's sinful. Yes. Yeah, and I would point to the history. You know, most of the laws that President Trump has us enforcing and passing new regulations, like the public charge rule that requires yeah. people who want to immigrate here legally to stand on their own two feet financially so taxpayers aren't burdened. All of those types of rules, so many of them come out of the 1996 immigration law that was passed on such a wildly bipartisan basis that it went through the US Senate on a voice vote. I mean, Chuck Schumer voted for this. He wasn't in the Senate then, he voted for it in the House. Uh, you know, and name after name, uh, Pelosi voted for one version of it. Bill Clinton signed this into law back at a time when immigration policy was about common sense, not these kinds of calculations. And unfortunately, it's become a political weapon uh, used by the left to achieve what they hope are long-term strategic goals of more voters for them, and do they, there's dollars involved. And so they've stopped making decisions based on what makes sense. But back when it was a common sense question, you get votes like the, the Fence Act in 06 that was voted on, it passed overwhelmingly in 2006, 10 years after the immigration bill, where again, Chuck Schumer, then in the Senate, Dianne Feinstein, people like this voted for the bill. And building the wall, which I was there Tuesday at the Donna Wall, and a, it's a levee and a wall, the engineer in me kind of appreciates that. But, uh, but it's part of a, over 126 new miles of wall under this president. We'll more than double that this year. We'll triple or quadruple it. Um, they voted for policies like this. Again, when it was common sense instead of political advantage. You know, just to that point, if I may, I think it's so important that we have a wall. And again, I'm coming, I'm, I'm an American, but of Puerto Rican heritage. And I appreciate Latinos and Hispanics but I appreciate America, and we have to defend America. And with the coronavirus, it's so important that we have a firm grip on our borders. Yeah, just a statistic for you. So walls work. In San Diego, in Tucson, when the president's wall got built, uh, crossings dropped by 25%. In Yuma, they dropped by three quarters wow. once the wall was built. They work. The officers tell you they work, and by the way, and this is a, important to me. I know it's important to you all. It's important to the secretary and to the president. They also help us keep our officers safe as they do their job keeping you safe. Yep. And uh, one of you mentioned, you mentioned the coronavirus, which is one of the questions I wanted to mention. This is a worldwide concern now. How important is a secure border? I know it's, duh, it's a no-brainer, but I don't think people are really connecting how folks could come here illegally and could have diseases, not just so, the coronavirus. Um, you know, some have reported on 
sickness at the border in the past. Uh, we deal with TB, measles. There are other things where we have large-scale medical complications that tends to fall on ICE. Right. Uh, the Border Patrol agents pass these people onto ICE who have procedures to deal with it. And we've dealt with hundreds, we've dealt with thousands. But when you're talking about a pandemic and you overlay that on a border crisis, and as much progress as we've made since last May, eight months of declining numbers, which hasn't happened since 1992, right. we still right. are at crisis levels. And we do not have facilities that can quarantine tens, scores, hundreds, thousands of people. So this creates a new wrinkle to the crisis where we have to look at ways to uh, bar entry. And I will tell you as Deputy Secretary at DHS, I'm not prepared to put my folks at risk uh, any more than any of you would, right? And so if you prioritize their safety and their health, where we don't have tools to necessarily deal with this, it, it limits our options rather dramatically. And it is, a, it is a great concern. I'm on the President's Coronavirus Task Force. We deal with a lot of aspects of this. We've been dealing with it at the airports and seaports and land ports yeah. effectively up to this point, but not with mixed with an illegal immigration crisis at the same time. Sure. And that's, that, is a, uh, that is not a happy thought. That's something we've obviously been planning for, but the options are terribly limited. Yes. Well, our time is almost up, but just to wrap up, any uh, issues or comments you want to make to deliver to the audience that we didn't get to cover briefly? You know, I just wanted to just, uh, you know, retort what you're saying. I, I think it's so encouraging and refreshing to hear that you're on President Trump's task force yeah. and that things are under control. They are for now. They are for now. And as we watch, thank you all. Look, the president has been very aggressive about this. Um, he only this week formally spoke about it, but he has been <laughs> whipping us with wet noodles for weeks now. Uh, uh, to work this very hard and to stay ahead of it. There's a reason the threat is low in the United States as of now. We have concerns as it spreads outside of China, it becomes much more difficult to control at, uh, in the United States. This is, to a certain extent, uh, a math challenge. And uh, before I went to the dark side and went to law school, I was an engineer, and so I, I appreciate the math, but it, it is scary in this situation. We do need to prepare, as the president said, as a society, for the possibility that this could get worse. Um, and he has had us preparing for that. You know, we don't do everything all out in the open um, just because it's all uh, options for possibilities. Um, but we've been very clear about what we've been doing and, and what it'll take to stem a bigger tide. And it is a daunting undertaking uh, across the entire government, which is why he added manpower to this whole effort and put the vice president in charge of it. But Make no mistake about it, whether it's border security or the coronavirus, President Trump has made your safety and the safety of America the number one priority of his administration. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Good to be with you all. Thank you, CPAC. Thank you.